The western desert is a place fit only for war. Thousands of square miles are nothing but sand and stone. A compass is as necessary, once off the road, as it is to a sailor at sea. Water doesn't exist until you bore deep into the earth. You bath in your shaving mug. Flies have the tenacity of bulldogs. Poses readily turn to desert sores. Days that are very hot can be followed by nights of bitter cold. When the hot Kamsin wind brings its sandstorms, life can be intolerable. The Arabs say that after five days of it, murder can be excused. The tide of this war in the desert has ebbed and flowed, but as Rommel advanced after we lost Tobruk, never had our backs been so close to the Suez War. We had lost 80,000 men and much booty. There were earlier lines of defense on which General Auchinleck might have stood. Sidi Barani on Mir Samatru, for example. But he was deliberately falling back on El Alamein, no more than 60 miles from Alexandria. To Rommel, advancing at considerable speed, Egypt, with the Nile Delta, which gives it life, Cairo, British general headquarters in Africa's principal city, Alexandria, Egypt's chief port and base of our Mediterranean fleet, and Suez, gateway to the Far East. All these must have seemed dazzlingly near, as near as a mirror, and as it proved, as much an illusion. It was a wise decision of General Auchinleck to come back to El Alamein, much the strongest natural line of defense between the Libyan frontier and the Delta. Moreover, Rommel's lines of supply were here stretched to the limit. On the right, our flank rested on the sea. On the left, it approached the Qatara Depression, a trough the size of Wales, one third of its salt marsh, and all of it territory that no vehicle can cross. On this 40 miles front, General Auchinleck took personal command. His, the total responsibility. Not another yard back were we going. His much depleted army dug, blasted and wired itself in and laid protective mines. Our front was one of discontinuous belts of minefields with strong points and machine gun and anti-tank gun emplacements. But it was as yet extremely slender. Here, General Orkin Lake waited. And with him, men who had fought at Gazala and Sidi Rezeg. Others who had been twice to Benghazi. Others who had escaped from Bir Hakim and Tobruk. The 8th Army had made a fighting retreat of 400 miles. And a battle which approached in its importance the Battle of Britain was now at hand. The Middle East, Suez, and infinitely more was at stake. The crucial days had come.
the line held. After several days of attack and counterattack, the British, Australians, Indians and South Africans were still there, fighting as dogged as our infantry at Waterloo. The immediate crisis was past, but anxiety remained. Into this situation stepped Mr. Churchill, bringing his own inspiration and vigor. He brought good news of reinforcements, both in men and supplies, which had already rounded the Cape. For five days, he visited the Army and Air Force, explaining the task and its importance. And most dramatic of all, he brought new commanders, General Alexander and General Montgomery. Alexander, one of the last men out of Dunkirk, and whose small army withstood the Japanese the whole length of Burma, and Montgomery, who took over the 8th Army, a man who lives as sternly as a Cromwell, and who is as much a part of his modern Ironsides. Landing grounds have been cut from the jungle. On this route, fly aircraft brought by ship to ports on the west coast and there assembled. The work has its own problems, among them malaria. Behind the line, great reinforcement. In the line, Rommel had come for us again. It was two months later. He told his troops that on this day, they were going to Cairo. But five days afterwards, he withdrew. He left nearly 300 tanks behind to prove his generalship. In two or three months, we recreated and greatly enlarged the Eighth Army. Into Middle East ports came men from the United Kingdom, India, and South Africa. The 44th Home Counties Division and the 51st Highlands Division had actually left Britain in May and June. And it was at the time Tobruk fell that President Roosevelt, who had Mr. Churchill with him at the time, ordered the first Sherman tanks to Egypt. Long-range planning was yielding its reward. Air Force kept guard. Rommel, with a supply line one tenth the length of ours, was himself building up his supplies as hard as he could go. But for a considerable proportion of them, there was no future. Our United Air Forces saw to that.
Royal Navy and Fleet Air Arm also were busy destroying Rommel's convoys. Within a few weeks, our Mediterranean submarines sank or damaged 24 enemy ships. In August alone, of all that was shipped to him, 80% went to the bottom. Meanwhile, the 8th Army trained to the last ounce. The physical fitness and hardness of an army is one of the biggest battle-winning factors in war. When two first-class fighters meet, he who sticks it longest wins in the end. This has been proved time and time again and applies to all ranks, from general officers to private soldiers. And this includes all branches of the army, whatever their job and wherever they be fighting fit and fit to fight. Towards the middle of October, preparations on both sides were nearing completion. In the north, Rommel's forces stretched from the coast to a point ten miles inland. Here were the bulk of his German infantry, comprising the 90th Light and the 164th Divisions, together with the Italian Trieste Division. In the south, holding a front of 14 miles, were three Italian divisions. These were strengthened by the rest of his German infantry. The centre was left deliberately weak held by a single Italian division, the Bologna, holding a front of 16 miles. Behind the infantry in the north were two armoured divisions, one German and one Italian, and similarly in the south. The British line began in the north with the 9th Australians, and below them the 1st South Africans. The 51st Highland Division, who had St Valerie to avenge, and the 4th Indian Division, veterans of Abyssinia and the Western Desert, held the centre. In the south were the 50th Division from the Tees and Tyne, with the fighting French of Bir Hakim and contingents of Greeks. The tactical reserve was found by the 44th Division from counties close to London. Our armoured divisions were three, all United Kingdom men, some veterans of a score of desert battles, others new to the work. One division, the famous 7th, held the extreme south. The other two were in close support in the north with the 2nd New Zealand Infantry Division alongside. Rommel was full of confidence. He was saying to journalists in Berlin, you may rely on our holding fast to what we have got. We hold the gateway to Egypt with the full intention to act. What we have, we hold fast. Hitler was experiencing one of his historic intuitions. He saw before him the destined conqueror of Egypt. And on him, he bestowed the baton of Field Marshal. Rommel hoped that if we attacked first, we should strike at his center. That hope we deliberately encouraged by the disposition of our forces. Having allowed our armor to break through, he saw himself destroying it by attacks from both flanks. That done, his own offensive would be launched. General Alexander, Admiral Harwood, and Air Marshal Tedder planned El Alamein together. It was to be a joint operation. Unity of command had become a reality. In the desert itself, General Montgomery and Air Vice Marshal Cunningham lived cheek by jowl. There was no divided command, said General Montgomery. There was only one command.
General Montgomery, realizing that a citizen army fights best when it knows exactly what's going on and what it is going to do, saw to it that the plan of battle was known to everybody from general to private soldier. And it came down from one rank to another till the chain was complete. So that senior officers fighting in their third desert winter shared the knowledge with troopers going into action for the first time. The battle was against fixed lines. And against fixed lines, General Alexander said, the tactics are just like breaking down a wall with a crowbar. You drive it in as far as possible and then lever this way and that to make a small hole. Then you enlarge it. As soon as you have made a hole large enough, your armored divisions go through to wreck the enemy's artillery and lines of communication. As for General Montgomery, he said his intention was to hit the enemy for six right out of Africa. The final preparations began. Now that all knew what was to be done, and all was made ready, there were final moments of normal desert life. Of rest, of washing clothes, of a swim in the sea for those near the coast, of cooking the evening meal. The coming of dawn over the Mediterranean, the sunset with a touch of green in the horizon, the mirage turning sand into water and sprinkling that water with the sails of small ships. Many a soldier saw these things, perhaps for the first time. And he wrote his letters home and smoked and talked things over, or lay silent as he listened to the pipes playing Highland Laddie. The Battle of El Alamein began in the evening. As light failed, the final moves were made. The 8th Army watched Rommel's lines. 
lying in moonlight and shadow. At zero, minus 30, the barrage begins. At the same moment, the sappers will move forward to clear gaps in the enemy minefields, marking the gaps with white tapes. After 30 minutes, the barrage will lift from the first objectives and creep forward. At zero hour, 10 o'clock, the infantry will advance. morning, the first objectives were in our hands. The barrage had done its work. The guns had been heard in Alexandria, 60 miles away. The enemy had been taken partly by surprise. Our infantry took some prisoners in their pajamas. But elsewhere, fighting was severe. There was a good deal of bayonet work.
now our forces moved up, consolidating and advancing further. Infantry, tanks and air force working as one. After a hard day's fighting, the 8th Army had made a salient in the north six miles wide and to a depth four miles beyond the first enemy minefields. Next day, attacks were made in the centre and south, the attacks that Rommel had been expecting and which he thought were the real thing, but they were merely diversions. In fact, our main attack was to be in the north. The 8th Army's crowbar had been driven in and was being levered this way and that. In our salient, the Australians were attacking again and secured a three mile front running west northwest. Rommel counter-attacked repeatedly during these days, both on the ground and in the air. force was doing a magnificent job. For the Luftwaffe, the skies became a place of deadly peril, and the machines that escaped us there were destroyed on the ground. Day of the battle, Kidney Ridge was assaulted by troops of the 7th Armoured Division, riflemen, light tanks and armoured cars.
hostage was taken. In the meantime, the Australians, backed by British tanks, were exploiting their former northward thrust and driving a wedge still further into the German forces near the sea. now fighting back with little pause and with increasing desperation. bitter work, cut off large numbers of Rummel's infantry, some of whom for the time being fought on isolated. The casualties suffered were heavy on both sides, but large groups of prisoners were in our hands. While the battle in the north was raging, Rummel had been forced to act. We had imposed our will on him. He moved two panzer divisions, the 21st and Ariete, from the south to just below our salient. The Air Force began the task of preventing them from concentrating.
General Montgomery now gathered his entire armor, including his division from the south, ready for the crowbar's final thrust. The first phase was finished. On November the 1st, the ninth day of battle, the 8th Army advanced on its entire front of 40 miles. But the blow we meant to be mortal was struck at the head of the bulge. was the breakthrough. Within two hours, our light tanks were 40 miles behind Rommel's lines, destroying his transport. The result was consternation and chaos. The moment that Alexander and Montgomery had been waiting for had come. The entire weight of their armor was in readiness, and like a fleet of ironclads, it sailed through the gap. Its purpose was simple, to destroy Rommel's armor.
this day, November the 3rd, the heaviest armoured battle of the campaign had been waged. Fighting went on along the whole front, but it was centred on El Akatia, where a tank battle of the bitterest kind reached, hour by hour, a deeper and more bloody intensity. Three quarters of the Axis tanks were burning or otherwise wrecked. As the day faded, the battle still continued. At El Akakia, we captured the dominating ridge. Our air force had almost annihilated the Luftwaffe. And now our entire strength pounded an enemy beginning to crack. This is the BBC Home and Forces program. This is Bruce Belfridge. Here's some excellent news which has come during the past hour in the form of a communique from GHQ Carter. It says, the Axis forces in the Western Desert, after 12 days and nights of ceaseless attacks by our land and air forces, are now in full retreat. <laughs> Battle shown and plenty more where that came from. The Africa Corps, utterly broken and possessed with no thought but flight, was hotly pursued. But the 8th Army was not only the thunder behind, but the lightning ahead. From hull down positions on the road of escape, our guns and tanks knocked out on the first day of retreat over 50 of Rommel's remaining panzers without loss. He had already left 500 tanks behind him on the battlefield. We captured over 1,000 pieces of artillery. Up to 1,000 aircraft, from troop carriers to fighters, were wreckage on the ground. Italians in the south, abandoned by Rommel with neither food nor water, were swept up by us to the tune of five divisions. In the north, we took thousands of Germans. Among them were von Thoma, commander of the Africa Corps, Burkhardt, leader of the German parachutists, and eight Italian generals we buried 20,000 enemy dead. But in rendering our own dead the same final duty, great care had to be used. For the Germans, on several occasions, had attached booby traps to our men's bodies. Pursuit was remorseless. Every enemy column on the coast road or in the desert sometimes jammed head to tail, was bombed, blasted and machine gunned. They tasted what they'd administered in France and Poland. forces on the ground had crushed Rommel's flimsy rearguard and were sweeping on. After two days' pursuit, rain fell and the chase was much impeded. Stretches of road turned to shallow streams. Aircraft landing grounds were waterlogged. Despite the rains, however, on the fourth day we had taken, after a brief fight, Mirza Matru the first of the newly captured ports the Navy used to bring up supplies.
The first heavily mined roads were encountered at Halfire Pass, where the twisting road rises 700 feet. From then onwards to Benghazi, 450 miles further west, every pass had been blown by the enemy, and every mile of road had to be examined and cleared of mines and obstructions. The engineers worked night and day. To Saloum, the Navy brought a million and a half gallons of water and other vital supplies. By the eighth day, the enemy had been cleared out of Egypt. Tobruk, whose name is written deep in our Middle East campaigns, Tobruk, which we held as a fortress behind the enemy lines for nine months and which had already changed hands twice, was ours once more. The date was November the 13th. In Cyrene, the Eighth Army passed from desert to a green countryside, which its Italian colonists had abandoned. And it was no more than a week between our taking Tobruk and entering Benghazi. At Benghazi, we paused to replenish our supplies. The harbour, bombed by us for over two years, so regularly that the pilots called it doing the mail run, was now littered with sunken ships. Cranes, installations and most of the quays were demolished. Yet the Navy and engineers worked to such good purpose that before long our ships were unloading. By sea and land, we were soon bringing up three million gallons of petrol a week and 8,000 tonnes of ammunition. While we had been building up our strength, Rommel had been digging in at El Aguila. But after remaining three weeks preparing to fight, he changed his mind and withdrew as soon as he felt the full weight of our attack. His indecision achieved nothing except to intensify our new onslaught. From El Aguila to Tripoli is 530 miles. It took the 8th Army 41 days to accomplish it. During that time, they fought several actions with Rommel's rearguards, putting down on one occasion a barrage rivaling that of El Alamein. But though we were delayed, our onward sweep was never in doubt. Just before the last stage began, General Montgomery said in an order of the day, nothing has stopped us since the Battle of Egypt began. Nothing will stop us now. And nothing did. Eight days later, we were fighting on the outskirts of Tripoli itself. The surrender of Tripoli by the governor of Libya and the mayor of the city extinguished the Italian overseas empire. Country by country, the British army had conquered it. Abyssinia, Eritrea, Italian Somaliland, Libya, Tripolitania. Not a single town now remained to them. days, the 8th Army had advanced close on 1,400 miles, a feat unparalleled in military history. Throughout the battle and advance, for every casualty suffered, it had inflicted five on the enemy. In the words of Mr. Churchill, You have altered the face of the war in a most remarkable way. What it has meant in the skill and organization of movement and maneuver what it has meant in the tireless endurance and self-denial of the troops 
and in the fearless leadership displayed in action can be appreciated only by those who are actually on the spot. But I must tell you that the fame of the Desert Army has spread throughout the world.